All right, we have some folks joining us. We'll get started in just a few minutes with the Smitty Story Hour. Um, demystifying the college admissions process. Um, where were you when I went to school? Hannah's not allowed to answer that. <laughs> we'll just wait a few minutes, give folks time to log in, including Steve Frederick, who is a little bit delayed from a meeting, but he'll be here any moment now. I'm gonna mute my phone because I forgot to do that before we started. If everyone would jump into the chat and uh, give your name and class year and where you're joining us from. For instance, I'm gonna jump in. The simple as that, your name, your class year, and where you're signed in from tonight. Catherine Clamo is on. She's one of our newly elected alumni board members. Oh, somebody raised a hand. Hi, Andrew. Dwayne and Jim. Q and A. Chat disabled. Well, that's not right. Will let me, will it let me enable it? Hannah, I might have to call in. Oh, I found it. Never mind. Andrew, give it a shot again. See if I fixed it. Please. Aha. It's working. Thank you, Andrew. Oh, and Dan's listening too. Kate and Dan are listening. This is great news. Hope we're gonna see you all in October for our alumni board meetings, as well as trustee meetings that weekend. Busy weekend for us. San Diego, all right, Andrew. All right, we'll just give another minute here. <laughs> Come on, levering. Yes, there we go. <laughs> They're in Suther Sunderland, Vermont. Am I saying that right? I'm probably not saying it right. Sorry. The other side of the lake. <laughs> So we'll get started in just a moment. Um, again, it's the Smitty Story Hour, talking about college admissions process. Um, we have other Smitty Story Hours coming up, one a month during the academic year. Uh, now that we can do events in person again, we're gonna keep this going, but just one a month for right now. Um, I'm not sure what our next topic will be, but the next date, I believe, is October 20th. We have a couple of different possible guest hosts those nights, but I don't want to spoil anything. So you'll just have to wait, find out. Hi, Amy, is Jay with you? How about your son? <laughs> 
Jay's probably working. He works an awful lot. Only Amy. Oh, well, that's okay. We're glad to have you here. We'll record it so Jay can listen later. <laughs> uh, quality over quantity. Good point. Good point. <laughs> All right, Hannah and Bob, I'm going to turn it over to you and let you get started when you're ready. Um, again, we're talking with our folks from our enrollment management admissions team. Um, this will be recorded. So if you miss something or if you want to show somebody later, it will be available on our website. Give me a few days, probably be sometime early next week that it'll be available on our website. All right, with that, I turn it over to you. Great, <clears throat> great, thanks, Heather. Um, you know, this was uh, a, a kind of an, a, a wonderful idea that um, Heather and I kind of came up with a little while ago about is, you know, we have we figured we have alumni and, you know, who might have students and, and sons and daughters going through uh, the college admissions process. You know, why don't we share some of, you know, our knowledge and expertise in, in this field uh, with them and, and at least, you know, try to help out uh, with any questions and, and guidance that, that we could provide. Um, and so that kind of then evolved into the Smitty Hour and uh, Hannah Ackerman, who's our, our Director of Admissions, you know, jumped on board as well. And so uh, we're going to start off, let me introduce myself and Hannah's going to say a little bit about herself and then we're going to jump right in. Um, I've been at Paul Smith now uh, since January of 21 uh, as the Vice President for Enrollment Management. So I, I oversee the admissions office uh, for both graduate uh, programs and undergraduate, as well as the financial aid office. Um, and uh, this is probably, I think if I remember correctly, Hannah, this is my 32nd year uh, doing college admissions. So uh, it's kind of uh, old hat for me in, in many ways, but um, you know, Paul Smith is a very unique and uh, different institution in the marketplace, and it's been really exciting to be part of the team here and uh, and really working towards uh, so, some really great goals for our uh, enrollment, you know, in the coming years. Um, but I'm going to let Hannah introduce herself and say a little about her background, and then we'll get going. Thanks. Uh, so my name is Hannah Ackerman. Um, I am the Director of Admissions here at Paul Smith's. Um, I'm also a proud alum myself. I graduated back in 2011 with a degree in hotel resort tours and management and minored in business. Um, so the, I've been now at Paul Smith for six years. Um, prior to that, I was at the Mirror Lake Inn in Lake Placid, if any of you are familiar with that. Um, kind of working my hospitality chops a little bit um, at a really fantastic resort. Um, but it was great to come back to Paul Smith's and the opportunity presented itself. And, um, I've definitely really grown to even more appreciate, you know, the, the institution and how much we have to offer students. Um, and I'm really proud of what we do for students and how much um, we have an impact on a lot of their lives. So excited to go through this tonight um, and kind of talk a little bit about the overall admissions process, but also a few Paul Smith specific things too. So if you have any students um, in mind, prospective students in mind um, for Paul Smith, send them our way. We're happy to answer any questions. Great, thanks, Hannah. Um, so we decided we would kind of break this down into, um, into uh, a kind of four big buckets of, of information. Uh, first is just the, the college search in general, like pretty much starting with sophomores and juniors in high school and then kind of going through into senior year. Um, and just some of the things you can be doing, you know, when you're in your sophomore, junior year. And then uh, we're also going to talk a little bit specifically about uh, visiting campus and what campus visits uh you know, can, you know, how, how productive and, and, uh, and not, not just enjoyable, but also productive they can be for you. And then uh, we'll, we'll get into the application process. You know, that's really kind of, you know, when, once you're gearing up for your senior year and kind of getting the, your essay and letters of recommendation and all those other things. 
And then we thought we would finish it with a little bit of, of talk about uh, financial aid and financial assistance, um, because obviously that's a huge part of the de decision making that families and, and uh, uh, you know, uh, students have to do, uh, especially in this day and age. So those were kind of the, the things we're going to hit on. Um, we're going to leave ample time, <clears throat> excuse me, at the uh, at the end for questions. So. Um, you know, if you're thinking of things, you know, that you, you want to ask, you can always throw them into the chat and then we'll, we'll get to them. Uh, and then we'll have plenty of time at the end to, to kind of go through whatever's on your mind and, and forgive us if we throw out like a, a boatload of information tonight. Um, you know, sometimes we get to, you know, passionate and talking about these things and we just keep going. So, um, so we'll start off a little bit with, uh, with the college search and, um, there's a couple of things, you know, really when you're in high school uh, as a sophomore, or even in your junior year um, that you can start doing. And that is uh, really looking at, at different websites. I think, you know, having uh, so much access to the internet and to Google and, and other search engines. And uh, there's a lot of different tools out there that students can do to research colleges and find out um, you know, what might be of interest to you. So, I mean, the best thing is, and the easiest thing really, and, and what most students do is just go to like Google and put in the name of a college and, you know, you'll pretty much get right to their website. And you can kind of, at that point, look and see what majors they offer, you know, what their admissions process is like, um, you know, uh, what their costs may be, uh, and just basic in information about the school. There's also other um, search, uh, college search tools that are out there. Uh, Big Future, which is run by the college board, is, is a popular one. Um, if your high school has uh, like Naviance or Family Connection as a, uh, uh, that your guidance office uses, that has a really good college search feature to it. Um, if your high school is using SCORE as uh, its guidance uh, tool, um, again, they have a search feature in there as well, um, but there's other places you can go to, My College Options, uh, College Express. Um, those are all really good uh, websites. Uh, Niche um, is another one that, that comes up a lot, um, but these are just really tools to introduce you to colleges and really just kind of get the, the upfront information uh, about schools. And, and I think that that's, you know, at least one thing, you know, when you're a sophomore and junior in high school, you can really start doing that. And even parents, you can do that too. If you're curious about a school or want to try to find schools that are similar to a, a certain school, uh, that's a helpful tool as well. Um, the other thing I think that's important is uh, at least sometime during uh, your sophomore, junior year, try to visit at least one college campus. Not necessarily, you don't have to have your list narrowed down that early, but if there's a school that interests you or piques your interest, or there's a, a college or university that's close to home, um, go onto their website, schedule a tour, and just kind of get a feel for it. Um, I think one of the important things about that is you will not, not so much that you're going to find out whether you like that school or not, but one of the most important things is it, it, it comes out of, of that like first visit is you kind of learn a little bit about like maybe what you don't want in a college like oh my gosh I don't want this or I don't want that um, and that's part of the narrowing down process too and, and I know Hannah's going to talk a lot more about about college visits in, in, a, in a few minutes um, but the other other things you should be thinking about at this point one would be um, you know it's sometime during your junior year you should meet with your school counselor or a college counselor um, and just start hashing out, you know, some of the things you may be interested in or thinking about studying or, um, uh, you know, what are, what are some of those areas that, that you know, uh, that pique your interest or schools that pique your interest. That's, school counselors can be a really great resource uh, because they've been through this process with tons of students and have lots of experience. They, uh, and they also know your school and how your school uh, and those students who have applied have fared at all those colleges and universities. So they they have a lot of information. They have data. 
Uh, and it, they're a really great resource. And so definitely in your junior year, start start talking to your, your school counselor about, you know, your college search, you know, from time to time. I think that's a good, a good thing to do. Um, testing, you should also be thinking about uh, whether or not uh, you're going to take the SAT or ACT or not take any at all. Um, like at Paul Smith, we are test blind, which means we don't look at test scores at all. Um, we, you know, some schools are test optional, some schools require testing. Uh, during COVID, a lot of colleges kind of moved away from requiring tests, but some are coming back and requiring them again. So it is something that you should be thinking about. I always recommend that students take the SAT or ACT um, at least sometime in the spring of their junior year. Probably, usually there's like a, a March or April offering. Um, at least that gives you a baseline of you know, how you're doing, maybe what sections you need to work on. Um, and then you can revisit it in like May or June and take it again. I don't recommend taking more than like two or three times you know, a, a test score. Statistically, it's shown that once you, after the third time you take a standardized test, um, your scoring tends to level out and you really don't see any material gains uh, in your score. So two or three times usually will give you a pretty good, a pretty good idea of, of where you're gonna land on, on, the, on the tests if you're, if you're looking at schools that, that require that. Um, and honestly, I, as a parent of two students, um, who, one who's a senior in high school and one who recently went through it, um, the, you'll find that the ACT and SAT are very different. So the ACT, um, a lot of students feel comfortable with that because the subject matter is more familiar to them, where um, some students feel you know, more comfortable with the SAT because of the way the test flows. So, it's really a feel in some ways um, as to which you may prefer. So uh, if you have the ability to take both or take a practice test for both and see which one you, you feel more comfortable with, I really suggest that. And then, um, and then come up with a plan as to when you may take it, you know, which test during the, the spring of your junior year. Um, and then also as you move forward, and we'll talk about this in the application process in a few minutes, but as you move forward, um, you'll, be, you'll be mindful a lot more uh, when you start your applications, like what schools are requiring, you know, which tests. And you also don't have to send your test scores to a school unless you're ready to, or, you, uh, or even in some cases, if you don't want to, you don't have to. Um, you, you have the choice as to where you want to, to send those test scores and which ones. Um, so lots to, you know, lots to consider there. Um, I don't want to linger too much on that. Uh, however, it is um, it is something that as a junior in high school, you do have to you know, start to, to kind of wrap your head around that. And then uh, even when you get into your senior year, um, if there's still opportunity in October, November uh, to still take a, uh, an SAT or ACT if you, if you want to or need to. Um, and lastly, the most important thing, honestly, for a lot of students is uh, they ask like, well, what can I do or what's the best thing I can do to, you know, in my junior year to, to get ready for college and all joking aside, though, know, like grades, like absolutely do well. Um, that junior year is the last full year of grades and coursework that a college will see on your transcript. And in many instances, uh, because of the timeline in senior year uh, and with applications, they only might see your first quarter. Uh, or maybe the first half of, of your senior year. But junior year is the last full year that colleges get to review. And they do look at all four years of, of your high school transcript. So they are looking to see your progression. You know, have you, have you increased, you know, each year? You know, are you continuing to challenge yourself? Um, how have your grades, you, you know, been? Um, are they consistent? Are they, you know, inconsistent? What, you know, uh, obviously, with COVID, you know, uh, that really kind of threw a monkey wrench into a, a, a lot of students' progression, and, and, you know, college admissions offices are mindful of that. Um, but really, as a junior, uh, even as a sophomore, uh, you know, that's going to be your, your most imp important homework assignment is do well on your grades and your coursework, you know, throughout, throughout that junior year. Um, 
so those are some things that you can be doing, you know, if you're a sophomore, junior in high school, those are things you can be doing now, you know, at this point in the cycle before you really get to senior year and applying for colleges. And so those are things, you know, we wanted to share, you know, that are, you know, uh, you know, things to be thinking about, things to be working towards. It's nice to kind of create maybe a timeline uh, that you can use, you know, throughout your junior year that says, okay, you know, I want to be, you know, take a test, you know, by this date, or I want to meet with my school counselor by this date, or I want to, you know, at least research five schools by, you know, such and such a time or visit one school over my spring break. Um, it's nice if you have like set up some type of timeline like that, uh, that can be really helpful. Um, and then the, the next thing that I always talk to students about when they're starting their college search, there are four big questions that you need to answer to get things really going. Uh, one is how far or close to home you want to be. So do you wanna be a drivable distance? Do you want to be at a school that you're you know, as far away from home, like say San Diego, um, or do you wanna be uh, closer to home, like say Vermont, you know? So, um, you know, those, those are things that, uh, that you need to look at and, and, as a student and kind of decide you know, where your comfort zone is there. Um, the other thing is how large or small of a college? Are you looking for a big state university, you know, you know a place like, uh, like a Penn State or a Michigan that has, you know, 40, 50,000 students? Are you looking for a smaller college, a small private college like Paul Smith's? Are you looking at a, a small liberal arts college? Um, or a medium-sized college, you know, something that's, uh, you know, maybe has 5,000 or 10,000 students. Um, there is such a variety. There are over 2,700 four-year colleges in the United States. So there is certainly a lot to choose from. And, and narrowing that down is, is important. And that one way is looking at size and, and what you think you might be comfortable with. And what you're thinking now, I should say this, what you think now may not be where you are, say, as a, as, as a senior, you know, in college, you know, those things can change and your comfort zone and what you're looking for can change. But in order to kind of get the ball rolling, these are, are, are some questions that, that it's good to start to, to ponder. Um, the other is setting. Uh, you know, what type of of a uh, setting do you want? Do you want something that's rural or suburban that has like maybe access to a city but isn't in the city? Or do you wanna be smack dab in, in like, you know, downtown New York or in Boston and, and have an urban campus, you know, in, in something that's maybe a little bit different? Or do you wanna be at a place that's, you know, a little more, you know, out of the way, um, but is really kind of has a strong focus on that college campus culture, you know, where the, the culture of the school is really the inviting, inviting and driving, you know, force around the experience. Um, so those are things to answer. And then lastly, but not least, um, what do you want to study? You know, what do you want to major in? What area academically, you know, do you, uh, do you see yourself, you know, moving towards? Again, you don't have to have the ultimate answer to this question. Um, I think it's something like 60% of college students will change their mind regarding their major before they graduate from college. So you may think you're going to come in for, uh, you know, uh, natural resource conservation, and you may end up, you know, leaving with a degree in forestry, you know, um, you know, those things, you know, can happen um, as you evolve through your, your college experience. But as you're starting to think about schools, this is gonna be one of the big drivers is, you know, what program, what type of major, uh, and does the school offer, offer that as well? So those are, uh, you know, my four big questions that I always tell students, you know, you need to kind of start to formulate some answers around these because that'll help hone down and narrow down that, uh, that college list as you, as you move forward. Um, I'm gonna turn it over to Hannah. And I think uh, you're gonna start talking about a little bit more about visiting colleges and visiting campuses. So Hannah, take it away. Awesome. Yeah, so to kind of echo off of those four big questions, right? As you're trying to decide, what do I want to do post high school, right? I am a perfect example uh, of why you should ask all of those questions and why your mind can absolutely change. 
I grew up in a very small town in central New York. Um, I graduated with 43 students in my class. Um, all through high school, I thought I wanted to be a music teacher. And so I was doing all the things to prep myself for that. And, um, you know, talking about having very specific admissions requirements to go into music education, you have to audition and get into the music school as well as getting into the actual college itself. So while I was taking private lessons and doing all of these things, prepping myself for this, my starting like my, the in between my sophomore and junior year, I got um, into audition season my senior year, started doing the audition. My mom was driving me all across New York state. Um, I had kind of established that I wanted to stay in a bubble, right? Um, I knew that I didn't wanna be more, really more than four hours uh, away from home was kind of my limit. And that's where I knew I wanted to be. So um, we did auditions at quite a, a number of schools across New York. Um, and the furthest one away was six and a half hours from the house. And as we were driving there, I said, mom, I don't wanna be here. <laughs> this is too far. Um, and so, you know, visiting these campuses, um, they were all very large campuses. I went to both public and private schools, all, all huge um, from where I was, you know, from where I had grown up. Um, and it wasn't until I decided to change my mind halfway through senior year and I said mom I don't want to do music at anymore and she said okay well what are you going to do Hannah and I said I'm going to Paul Smith's for hospitality <laughs> and so she was like well I guess we better visit then shouldn't we um so we uh took a drive out to Paul Smith thankfully I had vacationed up in the Adirondacks for most of my life um in this area we had stayed in Tupper we had been to the Vic to go see the, the butterflies um, we had done the trails in the area, so I knew this area very well. And it wasn't until I was driving onto campus in May, it was graduation weekend, that as soon as we drove onto campus, it was that feeling of like, oh, this is what I wanted. This was the small college that I didn't know that I wanted or needed. Um, and it was amazing. I, it solidified my, my choice. I knew exactly what I was going to do. And that's why the campus visit is so important. You know, so looking at in terms of like when you should visit colleges and things like that, like as Bob was mentioning, it's great to start, um, you know, your junior year. That's definitely when we see quite a number of students coming in, usually in, during the springtime for us. Um, we usually see a big pickup in like April, May, June, um, and then throughout the summer too of juniors who are now rising seniors. Um, so that's a great time to come visit campus. The other piece too, you know, when you're visiting a campus, it's always great to come during the semester when students are actually on campus. So you can see students moving about, you know, we've definitely seen time and time again with Paul Smith being so specific that it makes a big difference when you're walking around a campus and you see somebody that might look like you, you know, or have similar interests than you, you know, it's not uncommon to walk around our campus and see students with fishing poles or kayaks, you know, um, and to see somebody that might do the same things as you, or, you know, seem like they might be a, a friend, you know, that you could have down the line because they're wearing like a Patagonia hat, you know, or some kind of bass fishing hat, you know, something like that it makes a big difference. Um, so definitely visiting during the semester is huge. We see a lot of seniors come into us um, to visit our campus, usually in the uh, late fall. Um, we see them come in usually October-ish time. Um, and then we see a big pickup um, around uh, the May 1 National College Decision Deadline as well. Um, so there's a lot of various times, right? All colleges have um, times where you can visit pretty much throughout the year. We have special events where we do um, preview days for those that want more of a, um, just instead of an individual tour, maybe they want to do like a smaller group. So we try to always set up faculty visits and things like that. Um, you know, it's important to take a look at all the offerings that schools have. Most schools offer not just an individual visit or an open house, but they offer kind of that in between as well, you know. It's great to narrow down as you're heading into your senior year, narrowing down your list to around four to five colleges is usually best. Um, and, you know, uh, also evaluating them, you know, based on where you're accepted and things like that too. So visiting, you know, a certain number of colleges, you can visit as many as you want, absolutely. It definitely helps uh, to see all different types of campus. Uh, campuses um, and kind of where do you see yourself fitting. We're very big on fit here at Paul Smith's and 
um, you know, it's definitely a unique campus, right? So there's a lot of campuses that are more of that rural setting. There's some that are very urban. My sister went to a school in the capital region and then she ended up in Pittsburgh. Um, so total opposite than me, the woods are not for her, you know? So I think it's identifying like, where is your program a best fit? Where do you see yourself a best fit? So it is important to visit a few campuses, you know, and check everything out so that you're getting a good feel for what is the best fit for you. Um, the, the visit is just such an important piece of the puzzle, you know, and we see so many students who either come to us first or come to us after other visits. And it's, it plays out both times, but it's, it's a deciding factor for sure, you know, in the decision process, especially for seniors who have been admitted to multiple institutions. And as they're trying to make their decision, it's a, it's a really important piece of the puzzle to visit your college campus. Um, and again, do I fit here? Does this feel comfortable? Do I get the warm fuzzies, you know, every time when I drive onto campus, do I feel good here? So awesome, Bob, the next slide. So when you're looking at planning your visit, as I mentioned, a lot of colleges do different types of visits. So it's important to take a look at what they have um, and kind of what experience are you looking to get? Um, I definitely recommend to, you know, the sophomore juniors, um, open houses are a great way to get introduced to a college. Um, they're very generalized. It starts off for us, it starts off as a general presentation. We split the students and parents out into different academic groups. They go hear more of a generalized academic presentation based on a certain, um, based on certain programs. And I know a lot of schools do this too. Some have uh, certain open houses for say the School of Engineering. Um, some might have it for their humanities school, whatever the case may be. Um, so it's a nice way to get introduced to a wide variety that the school might offer. Um, and then we also include, um, you know, we make sure you have a chance to eat in the dining hall. Um, that's always a big part too, right? Um, what is the food like on campus? That's also a big piece of the puzzle. Um, and then, you know, learning more about how to apply, what the financial aid process looks like for that specific institution. Um, and then we do also include time to meet with athletics. Athletics is a big portion of a lot of our students that we have at Paul Smith's. Um, there's a, a quite a large chunk of students uh, that participate in athletics here at Paul Smith's, um, which really rounds out their experience here um, and makes so they can do both, right? They can have an athletic career, but also receive an education at the same time. Um, and then, of course, you know, academic support services. That's also a big piece of the puzzle. And of course, campus tour. You got to be able to see everything. Going to see a dorm, uh, going into a classroom, checking out the lecture halls, if there's multiple lecture halls on a campus. Um, just kind of getting, again, that feel, do I fit here? Is this what, where I feel comfortable? Um, if you're looking at something more as uh, at the senior level, doing an individual visit or a smaller preview day is a great option. For us here at Paul Smith's, um, our individual visits are can be absolutely tailored to what the student is requesting. Um, so we do our best to send a student out with a uh, current student um, so they can get the tour from them and hear a little bit more firsthand about what their experience is like. Um, student ambassadors are a great representation of the college. Um, you know, they, they're usually involved in a lot of different clubs or athletics. They might be an RA on campus. So they have a lot more of that insight um, into what it's like to be a student here. Um, you know, meeting with faculty, that's also a big piece too that we include in our campus tour. And some campuses do this as well, some others do this as well. But, you know, meeting with faculty to hear more about a program. If you have specific questions, say about fisheries and wildlife or about um, hospitality, how can I go on to become a conservation officer? How can I go on to become a forester? That's a great way to chat with faculty about what programs might fit your end career goals, um, which is also important, you know, is finding that match. Again, where do you feel comfortable? Where do you feel like will best support you as you head towards your end goal? Um, and then, of course, if you want to meet with a coach, you know, we have plenty of students who are recruited. Um, if you're looking at larger schools that might be D1, D2, D3, um, you know, there's all there's a lot that goes into that, into that recruitment process, you know, so meeting with a coach is important um, if you're considering athletics as well. 
Um, and then support services, um, meeting with the TRIO program, meeting with somebody from HEOP if you qualify. Um, you know, all of those things make up your whole campus experience. Um, so it is very important to ask for what you want. Um, if there's a certain department, a certain person that you want to meet with, ask. It can't hurt. The most they're going to say is they're not available at that time. You know, so it's a it's very it's a great resource, right? So take advantage of that tour, especially if you're coming from further away. We have some students that drive up, say from Cape May, New Jersey, right? That's an eight hour ride. We want to make sure that that experience is giving them everything that they need during their campus tour. So they, when they leave, they can say, wow, they covered everything that they, they needed to and that I had questions about. And then following up with them, you know, if you need a follow-up, say the open house went really great, but you want to do that more one-on-one -on -one experience, Come back, schedule another tour. That's and and or reach out and schedule something with faculty. Um, do it online. That, there's a lot of different options in terms of visiting campus. That doesn't have to always be physical, but sometimes just zooming in with faculty too. Okay, I think uh, I'm going to jump in really quickly and kind of rapid fire go through the uh, college application process. So. Um, once you hit your your senior year or getting you know uh leading up to your senior year in the summer um you know you start to really think about you know when and where you you're going to apply to, to to colleges you know now that you've hopefully visited campus you've done your research you know you're narrowing it down to you know the handful of schools that you're really looking at um there are two different ways two main ways to apply to colleges one is the common application this is a an organization that um, partners with over a thousand colleges and universities um, really allows you to fill out the application one time and then you can just fire it off, off to each individual school. A lot of the, the colleges uh, on that will have some specific questions that are tailored toward their college, but the bulk of the application is like kind of a once and done. There are some exceptions to this. Uh, a lot of, of um, uh, state universities like might have their own application, like the, the UC system in California has its own application. They're not part of the common application. Um, but there are some, you know, a vast majority of colleges, even public and, and a lot of privates are a part of the common application or most colleges have their own application. Um, we view those applications the same. It doesn't matter, you know, whether you use the college's application or use the common application. Both are, you know, are viewed equally. It's just really your preference as a student as to, you know, what you find, you know, easiest, what you find, you know, to, to work for you. Um, most of the, uh, of the questions are very similar. There might be a few more that the common application asks than, say, Paul Smith does on our own application. But for the most part, the bulk of the information is the same. Uh, the common application always becomes available August 1st uh, of your senior year. So at that point, you can start going in, work on it, create your, you know, um, all your, put in all your biodemographic information and, uh, and, and keep moving forward. A lot of things to be mindful of are deadlines and decision types. There's a, uh, several different types of, of decision that you can apply to. There's uh, early decision, there's early action, there's um, regular decision. Uh, the, they give you the quick primer on that. Um, early decision is, a, um, is when you have a first choice college, you know that's your, the college you wanna apply to, um, and uh, it's a binding uh, agreement between the student and the college. So if you're admitted, you're telling the college that you will enroll and you'll withdraw your applications from other schools. Um, so it's a it's a pretty strong commitment. So you got to really know that that's where you want to be. Um, there's early action, early action. Uh, and oh, sorry, with early decision, you're also going to find out earlier, usually like in November, December of your senior year, you'll get your decision. Early action, you're going to find out early, probably in that November or December timeline but the binding commitment is not there. It's just, you get an earlier answer uh, and you still have, you know, usually up until May 1st to, to make your final decision. Um, 
And then there's regular decision. And most colleges that have a regular decision, it's usually sometime after the first of the year. It might be January 15th, February 1st, March, uh, even into April. Um, some schools are on rolling admission where if you apply at any time, you know, you'll get an answer within a, a certain number of weeks. Um, so that's one thing that you want to keep in, in, in mind as you go through your senior year and, and are starting to look at your colleges and what are their deadlines and what are their types of uh, decisions that, um, that you may want to apply for or what applies to you. Um, there's a handful of schools, I will say, it's mostly the Ivy League schools that do have something called single choice early action, which means you can only apply early action to one of them. Um, but again, that's limited primarily to the Ivy League schools and maybe um, like Stanford, Duke, I think, um, you know, places like that. So it's, it's again, it's a small list. Um, but most schools usually have one or two of those options. They might have like an early decision and a regular decision or early action uh, and a regular decision, you know, like we have at Paul Smith. So, um, so you want to, you know, that fall of your senior year in terms of timeline, you know, that's where you really need to be, you know, finishing up your applications, you know, getting your essays written, all those things and, and be mindful of the, of the upcoming deadlines. Um, the, the parts of the application are really kind of, this is really the meat and potatoes, you know, the things that colleges are looking for and are looking at and reviewing with your application. First and foremost is going to be your high school transcript. So they're going to be looking at your grades, your coursework, you know, what I was talking about before about, you know, your progression through all four years, you know, how have you challenged yourself. Colleges look at you within the context of your high school. So they, um, Typically, we'll get a profile of the school so they know, you know what the course offerings are like, what the grading scale is like. They um, know what percentage of students go on to four-year colleges or two-year colleges. Um, so there's a lot of information that they're aware of um, to put your, your academic record into the best context possible. We don't compare students from like one school to the next. Like if you have like a Catholic school down the street and a, you go to the public school, you know, we don't look at them and try to, you know, play what ifs, you know, it's really just looking at you within the context of the school that you attended um, and how you did there. And that's really going to be the, the biggest bulk of what colleges look at in your application process. Um, as I said earlier about test scores, if a school is test optional, they're probably not putting a lot of emphasis on test scores. Um, if they do require test scores, then you know that is going to be part of their decision making. And again, like I said, you know, take it two or three times. You know, at at most, um, if you take it the first time, you're happy with your scores, you're done. That's great. Um, move on to the next thing. Um, the other things that colleges are going to look at is your essay. You know, they want to see students who have. A, a ability to express themselves, um, you know, you know, who can write. Um, I, I think that's it's one of those parts of the application where actually you get to share a lot more about your background, your experiences, um, your, you know, kind of what makes you tick, uh, you know, and, and I think colleges, you know, do like to see that, you know, especially since many colleges do a holistic review. Um, they want to make sure that you're a good fit for their institution. Um, and the essay, you know, is one of those pieces of the puzzle that, that can really, you know, make you stand out. Um, and it really, you know, provides a, a lot of insight. I would, a few bits of advice on the essay. Number one, always spell check your essay. That should go without saying, but like spelling errors shouldn't happen. Um, but just make sure you do spell check, but also proofread because sometimes spell check doesn't pick up things. One of my my favorite stories to tell is uh, reading an essay um, about a student who was involved in the Big Brother project, and it was very passionate, very you know about how you know he really made a difference in his little brother's life and everything. Except for every so often, he kept dropping the first R in brother, and kept referring to himself as a big bother, which was kind of humorous to read. Obviously, I knew what he was getting at, but spell check didn't pick it up. So um, that's why you got to proofread. So I, I do recommend proofreading. Um, and then the other thing is making sure that, uh, you know, there's two different types of people. I think Hannah would agree to this when, when we're reading applications. There are those of us who read 
and love the story. We want to hear like the whole narrative or the story or what it is that you're sharing. And then we have others of us who are grammar hawks who will, you know, look at every subject verb agreement, every punctuation error, um, you know, are you using the proper, you know, conjunctions or whatever, you know. Um, so, you know, I, I make light of that a little bit, but, you know, it's true. You never know who's reading your, your essay. So making sure that you have a good story and that you got your grammar down and you'll be in good shape. Um, also your activities and, and even doing like a, an activity resume is really helpful as well. Uh, don't be shy. Like the things you've been involved with in school, in your community, in your with your church or whatever the, the case may be, include those on your college application because that gives us an idea of, you know, what it is that, that you're passionate about. Where do you like to spend your time when you're not forced to be doing schoolwork? You know, when you, when you have the choice to do things that you like to do. Um, so those are things you should definitely expound upon and, and share in your college application. Um, you'll need at least two letters of recommendation for a lot of schools. Some schools it might be just one. Um, I always tell students, get letters of recommendation from uh, whoever's going to glow about you. Whoever is going to write you the best letter, who knows you. Um, say you want to study biology, you, you may you know, want to want to think, oh, I should get my biology teacher to write that letter. But if you don't have a great relationship with them, or if, if you don't think they're the type of person who's going to, you know, extol, you know, the virtues of, of, of you as a person or a student, um, go to the teacher that will, you know, that's fine. It doesn't have to correlate to your, your, your intended major at all. Um, just find letters that are going to, you know, really, you know, make things, you know, and don't, by the way, don't send it like 17 letters of recommendation. Um, we only have a limited amount of time to read applications. Um, so if, you know, two to three letters is good. Once you start getting up to five or six, we're going to start to wonder um, why you feel you need five or six letters of recommendation. Um, but also it just becomes a time, a time issue. We just don't have the time. So um and then lastly, if a school offers an interview, um, that's also another way to share your story and who you are and, um, and make a connection with someone in the, in the admissions office. Not every school, uh, not a lot of schools, I should say, offer, you know, require interviews or, or offer them. But if it's, it's something that you, um, you can take advantage of and you're outgoing and you love that one-on-one -on -one conversation, you know, college interviews are, are much more um, just conversations about you sharing, you know, what you're interested in and who you are and what you're passionate about. Um, it's not like the old like 70s and 80s movies like, you know, uh, like Risky Business or, you know, How I Got Into College where it's the, you know, the, the stiff, you know, college dean who's grilling you on current events, you know, uh, or anything like that. These are really just conversations. And, it, and again, it's a great way to share what you're interested in and your passion. So, um, so those are like the big elements of the application. Make sure that you you know kind of get those done and and uh, and get everything submitted on time. Um, timeliness matters, so definitely make sure you meet the deadlines. You know when when colleges have them, and usually by uh, you know you'll you know if you're applying early, like I said, you'll find out like in in November or December if you apply regular decision. Most decisions will be out by like March or, or uh, at April 1st at the latest, typically, um, which gives you time to, you know, uh, make sure you have your financial aid award, make sure you, you know what your scholarships are and have all the information you need to make a decision. So um, speaking of, of financial aid and scholarships, I'm going to turn it over back to, to Hannah to talk about financial assistance. And then uh, we'll, we'll, I want to be mindful of time. We'll make sure we wrap it up uh, and have time for some questions. Go ahead, Hannah. Okay. So this is always the big, the big kahuna uh, when it comes to making a decision, right? Uh, how much does it cost? Uh, so there's a lot of different um, ways to help bring down the cost of college. Um, so as a private institution, um, we are priced a little bit differently than say a public institution. Other things to be mindful of too, are you in state or out of state when you're looking at public schools? Um, there's a lot of pricing all over the place. Um, so, you know, one big thing for us is we always recommend don't make, don't make your list based on cost. Make your list based on 
where do you want to be? What program? Where are you going to be happy? Where do you fit? Those are the big, big ones, right? Um, so ignore the cost until it comes time for financial aid. Um, so when you're applying, put costs to the side, and then we can talk about financial aid after that. So there's a lot of different options for financial assistance um, when going to college. First and foremost, the FAFSA, the free application for federal student aid, keyword being free. It is a free application to complete. It opens on August or August. It opens on October 1st, um, so for the upcoming year. So the FAFSA this year will open up on October 1, so about two weeks or so, and that'll be for this upcoming year for fall 23 entry. Um, and what this does is it takes a whole bunch of information um, from the parents and it inputs it into this crazy calculation on the back end and it spits out an SAI, which is a new term for this year, which is taking over the EFC that you might be familiar with if you have any other um, uh, sons or daughters who might be who might have already gone through college. Um, but SAI is the student aid index, um, which is replacing the EFC, which is estimated family contribution. So what it ultimately is doing is calculating an amount that says you can afford to pay this, and then that's what's sent to the college to then offer up whatever additional assistance that it can. The FAFSA, a lot of times um, at private institutions, is what qualifies you for the uh, private school's money. Um, so at Paulsmith, we have a grant program, um, scholarships and things like that. But a lot of times you need to complete the FAFSA in order to qualify for those. So it's great, no matter even if you don't think that you're going to qualify for any additional aid because of income purposes or anything like that, it's still great to complete the FAFSA because you never know. Um, the same thing with the CSS profile. This is a little bit lesser known. Um, there's likely only about 100 schools throughout the country that use this but it's kind of an additional um, step to the FAFSA. And this you'll see in a lot more of the Ivy League schools. Um, it's just collecting additional financial information to see if you qualify for anything else. Um, dates and deadlines, as I said, October 1, that's the big one. Um, but a lot of schools might have a cutoff date for you know, when you can submit your FAFSA to um, receive a financial aid package for the upcoming year. For a lot of returning students at the institution, there's definitely a lot of reminders. We want those um, FAFSAs back in um, for returning students by like March. So that way we can get packages out for billing and things like that come um, the next upcoming fall semester. Another key piece too, um, all schools are required to have some kind of net price calculator on their website. Um, so this is again, going back to the beginning, using websites of different colleges and checking out their financial aid pages. Um, we have one on our page. It's not a perfect estimate of what you're going to pay because it doesn't take into account a lot of the outside scholarships and things like that that you might receive, but it does give you a, a little bit better of an idea of like, oh, so I'm not actually going to pay $50,000 to attend this school. It's going to be a little bit less because I might qualify for XYZ. So that's always really great. Next, Ben. There's a lot of different types of um, financial assistance as well. Um, so I kind of touched on a few of these. So types of aid, there's scholarships. So merit scholarships, um, this is generally free money that's given by an institution. Um, so this is all qualifiers based on usually high school GPA. Um, so going back, we're looking at freshman, sophomore, junior year um, for that cumulative GPA to award that scholarship in addition to the um, maybe class rank. Some schools also look at class rank as well. Um, grants are typically either given by an institution. They might also be federally or state funded as well. You might have New York State TAP, um, the Pell Grant. Um, uh, Vermont offers VSAC as well. So there's a lot of different opportunities for that. Um, loans, these can be federal loans, either direct loans, or um, they could be your outside uh, student loans as well. This is, there's a lot of nitty gritty that goes in with us. One great thing at Paul Smith's is we actually try to schedule an appointment with every student um, that has been admitted and receives a financial aid award offer. So that way we can go through that line by line and explain what's free money, what do you have to pay back and things like that. And a lot of schools will do that. You just have to ask. Cut me off. Got it, Bob. <laughs> 
Um, and work study, that's the other one too. Um, work study is a lot of schools do also offer this too. So it's a way for you to earn money while you're in school. Um, and a lot of times they're either federal funds or they might be institutional funds too. Another one that also does provide financial assistance as well, it may be an HEOP or an EOP program. So if you're a New York State resident, um, you do have an opportunity to apply to this program if you qualify. So HEOP stands for the Higher Education Opportunity Program. EOP is the Education Opportunity Program. The only difference between the two, EOP lives with uh, public schools in New York State. HEOP lives with private schools. So at Paul Smith's, we do have an HEOP program. Um, there are uh, income qualifiers, and then there's also um, academic qualifiers for HEOP as well. Um, so it usually starts with um, the application side of things for the admissions qualifiers and then an academic, and then it moves on to the financial side of things. But it does help to cover a lot of costs of going to college as well. So there's a lot of great resources to kind of search for, look for, you know, as you're going through the process. Now we can go to questions, Bob. <laughs> wow, this has been a lot to take in. Holy we cow. Told you, there's a lot. <laughs> Um, all right, so the first question we had, um, wanted to know how many female versus male students on campus currently at, uh, at our campus. Do we know what our, our makeup is? We are, uh, we are almost right on 66% male, 34% female. So that kind of two thirds to one third is, and that's been fairly steady for the last couple of years. Yeah. I was going to say, it sounds very familiar to me. Yeah. Um, all right, Andrew, internships between semesters can pay enough for to sustainably cover costs. Do you have ever have roundtable panel discussions with alumni so that potential students can see what is possible with a PSC degree? I kind of hear a future Smitty story hour. I don't know. <laughs> yeah, that, so we definitely try to take advantage of alumni when we can, when we're out working. Uh, but a lot of times we do find that it's helpful either to have them go into a classroom with us um, and do like a presentation, talk about what they're doing, that kind of thing. Or I know that they do bring quite a few back into the actual classrooms um, here at Paul Smith's to talk about what they're doing, how they got there and that kind of thing, which I know I took advantage of as a student. Um, and that was really helpful for me in working through, you know, that process. Where do I want to be when I graduate kind of thing? Absolutely. Um, I know that there's several alums that like to come back and, and recruit our students too. So when they come back for job fairs or career fairs, um, they sometimes weasel into the classroom too. So it's kind of nice because our students get to talk to alumni. Anytime that they can get together is really helpful. Do you have to apply for financial aid to qualify for a scholarship? Uh, no, in uh, most colleges, the uh, scholarship process is outside of, of the need based financial aid. So when you uh, like, for example, with us at Paul Smith, you will get your a letter of admission and in there will have your merit scholarship. Um, that is basically, uh, you know, something that, you know, we're awarding upfront aside from what's happening with with your FAFSA. The FAFSA is really about determining your financial need. And so it's kind of separate from the scholarship. Now, I will say this, like institutionally, a, a lot of colleges have like an endowed or a gifted scholarship program um, that might have elements of it that are looking for students who have financial need, in which case you would have to have a FAFSA on file, you know, in order for us to look at your need in order to see if those scholarships may apply to you. But that's like, you know, a lot of those, you know, can go to current students, but there are some, like I know at, at PSC, we have some endowed scholarships, you know, you know, gifted from donors or alumni who are geared towards incoming students um, and want to make sure that we're helping students who have needs. So in that, in that instance, yes, the FAFSA would be a requirement, but for a lot of colleges, the upfront, um, you know, merit scholarship or, you know, that you get with your admission letter is not necessarily dependent on the FAFSA. Okay, great. Um, I got a I question for, for Hannah and Bob. 
Um, what advice would you give to a student, uh, maybe someone like me, who was a B minus or a C plus high school student who really wants to go to college? What advice would you give to somebody like us? I can't hear you, Hannah. Oh, sorry. <laughs> I appreciate it. Thanks for telling me. Um, so I think uh, don't count yourself out. You should always try um, and always shoot for something that might seem unattainable because you might be pleasantly surprised. Um, there's a lot of schools where you don't have to be a straight A student to get in. You know, it's there's a lot of opportunity for you as a student. Um, you know, our our average, you know, Paul Smith student is anywhere between, you know, a 3.5 to a 3.78, you know, it's, uh, that's, that's average, but that doesn't mean that we take below that or above that too, you know, there's a lot of schools that definitely, again, look at you holistically and look at you for fit and not just solely based on your grades. You made yeah. me feel better, Hannah. Yeah, and there's, <laughs> Good. And there's a lot a lot of options out there I think that's the thing is um you know there's it, it, a lot of times you know what gets gobbled up in the media is like the you know the top tier institutions you know what's MIT doing or what's you know University of Virginia doing you know not you know great institutions but you know that's a very you know uh, specific type of school that has a, a very low admission rate the actually the national average of um for college admissions, uh, for, for colleges and universities is over 70% admit rate. So, you know, you, you know, at almost any given school, you probably have a, you know, a seven in, out of 10 chance, to, you know, to, to get into that school. So there are schools out there, um, you know, that have, you know, great opportunities for students who are, are those B students or B minus students, you know, um, you, there are places you can find a home, absolutely. Uh, what advice do you have for parents in terms of supporting their student through the selection and college visit process? I, I'm going to start this one, Hannah, because uh, I'm, I'm going through this right now. I have a daughter who's a senior in high school and I, yeah. my son's a sophomore <laughs> in college. Um, so I've, you know, it's kind of interesting living this as an admissions professional and also as a parent. Um, but communication is key. I think uh, communicating and and being you know uh, open about um, the college search is is good. A couple of bits of advice: um, you have to listen to each other. I think you know sometimes parents you know might have in their mind what they're thinking about that next step is for their son or daughter, um, but their son or daughter may have different expectations or aspirations, and I think you know, that you have to listen to each other. Also, time, time, you know, senior year is such a busy time for a lot of students. Um, so I, you know, what I try to do, I, and I'm doing this right now with my daughter, is we pick, like, take one hour, like, every other weekend just to talk about college stuff. And that's all the time. Like, in between there, I won't bother her. I won't, unless she comes to me, which is fine, but I won't go to her and, and we'll save it for those times when, that we set up so that she's not feeling stressed about it. So I think being mindful of time, um, be keeping open lines of communication, um, and then asking, you know, I think the other thing as a parent is asking when you can help. Like, you know, uh, if it comes up about visiting schools, hey, can I help schedule some of these or let's find, you know, a, a weekend or a time that works and then I'll help, you know, I, can I help you schedule them? That way you can be part of, of that process too. Do you have anything else, Hannah, that you would want to share? I think you hit it. You're the best person to talk about it, not me. <laughs> um, do you feel colleges are looking at the whole student and the impact COVID had on students' GPA in terms of merit or only admission? A great freshman year, not so great sophomore year, great junior year. And Maureen, I know it's you. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, uh, we've yeah, actually noticed that significantly. Yeah, we've re we've definitely noticed that and picked up on quite a few transcripts. Um, we can see that flux, and then we start counting back, and we realize, oh, that was COVID. You know, sure. so we've definitely picked up on it. 
Yeah, and and it's it it affected students differently. I think that, and that's one of the things that we're we're cognizant about is there are students who just did not thrive uh, learning virtually. Um, and and you can see, like Hannah said, you can see that that dip or that roller coaster, um, you know, in in their transcript. And and I think you know we still, uh, you know, the students who are seniors now, you know, like COVID started when they were freshmen, so we still have a couple more years of this, you know, to kind of work through on an admissions side. But yeah, I, I mean, the other things that we noticed is, um, you know, there are some schools that that really kind of became a lot more lax on their grading. And so, you know, we saw, you know, some students GPA spike a little bit, um, you know, during during that, uh, you know, would have well for these seniors would have been their the end of their freshman year, you know, just to get them through that cycle. So it's um it's a little bit of a jigsaw puzzle for us because I think you know one of the good things like Hannah said we're holistic so we look at every student and and if we have questions you know uh, we'll pick up the phone and, and call a high school counselor and say hey let you know can you tell me a little bit about the student and their progression um but yeah uh, to be honest Maureen it's 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 like the COVID thing is real and 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 we're aware of it and and I would say most of my colleagues you know at, at other colleges and universities. We, we've been talking about this for the last year or so um, because we're all seeing it. it it's out it, and we're aware of it. Yeah, my son's Spanish grade actually tanked when we went back into the classroom. So um, he did better when he was having more one on one time on online. And I could see where that could happen for sure. And he's a junior. So maybe you'll see him in a year and a half. <laughs> Does PSC offer? remedial classes for promising students. Go, go ahead, Hannah, I'll let you jump on that one. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, so um, they, so that we do offer a few remedial classes. Um, so long as they're like admitted to Paul Smith, um, then there is opportunities to take like a remedial math or remedial English, but we also offer a lot of um, support services on campus too to support those students that might need a little extra help. I think tutoring was probably one of the best things that when I was a student, um, I would tutor some classes, but then I also got a tutor for some classes and it was really beneficial for me. Being a tutor, it kind of, made me redo the work again and pay attention to it and i got better and better at accounting of all things but you know where i needed extra help yeah uh, nutrition big issue <laughs> <laughs> um so our tutoring center i can't recommend it enough all right if we don't have any other questions I'm sure if questions come up after the fact, if you were to send them to say admissions at Paul Smith, is it admissions or admiss? It's admissions, right? Admissions at paulsmith.edu. I'm sure someone there will help answer any questions or you can reach out to me in the alumni office. I'll find someone to answer your question or I'll make something up. So, you know, that's fun too. Um, and for any of those who may not know, as an alumni, if you're going to have a student coming to Paul Smith who really belongs here, you can also give them a pass it on scholarship. If you want more details about that, just give me a call or send me an email and I'll help you out. Um, all right. Well, thank you both for being here tonight. This is great. Steve, I'm so glad you could make it. <laughs> yes, I rushed back to make it for the Smitty Story Hour. So absolutely, Hannah and Bob, you guys are fantastic. It's a pleasure to work with you both. You're real pros, and uh, thank you for uh, preparing for this tonight. Good information. Yes, absolutely. All right. Thank. No, it's it's great to to be able to do this for alumni, and uh, and you know we really enjoyed uh, you know having a conversation about it tonight. And sorry if we threw a ton of information at you, but is hopefully it was helpful. <laughs> well, Welcome it's all to recorded, our jobs, right? right? <laughs> <laughs> now, this is this is going to be recorded, and you can find it on the website. So if you it want, it is uh, being recorded. It'll be wanna... online about a week or so. But again, but if a question comes up. Or if you know somebody who couldn't make it tonight, you said, hey, I listened to a really good presentation, direct them right to the website and they can watch the recording. Absolutely. All right. 
Well, Thanks, thank everybody. You so much. Have a great thank evening. You. Bye. Bye, Bye, guys. Thank you.